Hey guys, Dr. Shook here. Hope you're doing well today. Um, I just have a few minutes today because um, I'm a little bit short on time, but I'm in the sauna um, right now, and then I'm going to work out. I'm going to get my workout in in about 30 minutes. So um, what I wanted to do today was uh, talk to you guys a little bit about the importance of stress and its impact on your, your thyroid hormone and um, Really, it has numerous effects, but we want to talk about how it's going to impact the thyroid. So, with with stress, you know, stress is not something. Um, it is something that definitely will manifest chemically within the body. Okay, so you will you will definitely if you're if you're under stress, you're going to have physiological, biochemical changes that are measurable. Hey, Janice. No, no quitting. Come on, hang in there, hang in there. Hey Jessica, so um, you definitely listen. If you're under stress, guys, you're gonna have um, you are going to have you're gonna have measurable biochemical changes. Okay, that you're gonna be able to 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 check in the blood. And <clears throat> the way that that stress connects to your thyroid is that the cortisol levels that's your stress hormone. So when you're under stress, your body's gonna produce higher levels of cortisol. And cortisol has numerous effects on the thyroid and numerous effects on blood sugar, um, on healing. Because cortisol, it has anti-inflammatory properties. Because when you're under stress, lower inflammation um, helps you to cope with that. We're going to talk about the different types of stress. Uh, but it, it also is catabolic, so it can break down tissues and it can actually contribute to um, some actually uh, degeneration, um, impaired mucosal healing. So if you're trying to heal leaky gut, it can be a problem. So... Okay, so there, there are three primary types of stress. You're going to have um, emotional stress, which is, th these all have, you know, it's the same kind of response by the body. Emotional stress, um, chemical stress, and then uh, physical, physical stress. So, so uh, let's use an example. Emotional stress, maybe you're in a bad relationship. Maybe you hate your job. Um, maybe um, you have financial stress and that manifests emotionally. Um, maybe there's, you know, relationships, you, you name it. There's, there's a lot of different types of, uh, of things that can create that emotional stress. Maybe you're just driving to work in the morning and the traffic's so bad that it stresses you out. So these are all ways that you're going to feel stress. You're going to, if the, your body's response is to produce and increase your catecholamines, your, your cortisol and your adrenaline primarily. And so that, that increase in cortisol, it does a lot of different things, guys. It will, we know with the thyroid that high cortisol levels can encourage disconversion. So T4 conversion in the liver could be more directed towards reverse T3. And reverse T3 is kind of like a break. Uh, it could also um, create issues with um, receptor sensitivity. So all the cells in your body may be less sensitive with higher cortisol levels to your, to your hormones. Uh, let's see. Um, blood sugar, uh, cortisol also will cause an increase in blood sugar. So when I work with people that are that have diabetes, they're they're type two diabetics, or they have any problem with blood sugar regulation. You know, everyone focuses on diet and exercise, but the main things that are missed there are going to be cortisol. The other things that are missed are there's two things that are missed, which is cortisol and inflammation, because cortisol will raise blood sugar. So if you're only focused on diet and exercise, you may not be realizing that there's this, there's this huge impact from cortisol that needs to be addressed that's keeping the blood sugar high. And then the inflammation is, uh, is another thing that will decrease sensitivity to insulin. But going back to cortisol and its impact on the thyroid, basically the cortisol is, is also catabolic, which I mentioned a little bit earlier. You know, there's different types of steroids. So there's typically anabolic that build, like testosterone and things that will build. And then there's cat, there are catabolic steroids like cortisol, which is uh, anti-inflammatory, but will also contribute to um, breakdown of tissues and not necessarily building of tissues. And you need balance and you need both of those. So the thing is, is that with these different types of stress, guys, um, the emotional stress, the physical stress. So if you are in like have a lot of pain, if you have a lot of musculoskeletal pain, you, you know, that's that will also trigger a stress response. All right, guys, I'm getting ready to get out of here, um, but we'll talk a little bit as we go. Because um, I'm just warming up in the sauna. I'm not actually trying to break a sweat. This is my way to kind of cheat. <laughs> so I'm not walking on the treadmill. Um, <clears throat> so there's physical, right? There's physical, um, physical stresses. So musculoskeletal pain. Those are all things that will stimulate a stress response and create some problems. 
the next thing is, um, so, so if, you're in, if you have physical pain, right, how are you going to handle that? Well, you need, you need to try to address the source of the physical pain. If you're like overweight and that's causing a lot of compression of your joints and accelerating um, osteoarthritis or musculoskeletal pain that way, then an obvious place to start, if you mm -hmm. haven't, would be focusing on a really good diet like autoimmune paleo, you know, like we've talked about a lot would be helpful in trying to help you decrease inflammation from food. There are a lot of supplements and things that you, you might want to be able to, that you could take that would help to um, improve your, your biochemistry and could help with pain. So th if, there's, if there's physical pain, you've got to try to address the cause of that. And sometimes the best way to address physical pain is to actually address your internal chemistry first because that can, uh, there, there you can have uh, inflammatory internal chemistry that's perpetuating and sensitizing your nerves to pain, okay? Uh, the third thing is chemical stress. So if you have inflammation within your body, let's say due to chronic infections, autoimmune conditions, those are all things that will uh, promote a stress response and promote the increase of cortisol. And cortisol, again, has all these negative impacts on your thyroid. So really kind of looking at what's going on is important and trying to address those things. Now, <clears throat> because you know the cortisol can create lots of problems for your thyroid hormone physiology. So one of the things that you want to consider doing guys is <clears throat> cuz I want to get to like what what you can do. So obviously you can try we've talked a lot about diet and diet's important to help with uh, from an anti-inflammatory perspective to eat and get an anti-inflammatory um, menu and anti-inflammatory foods into your body. Okay? That's really important. The main thing there is that they're whole foods that they are, um, you know, most of them are, are raw foods if you can, right? But, you know, whole foods is going to be a huge upgrade in your diet over processed foods. So that's one thing. That will get you, that, that will get nutrient-dense foods into your diet. So things that are really, really um, high in nutrients and minerals versus the processed stuff that are fortified with a lot of really, um, a lot of nutrients that aren't usable by our body are as usable and full of a lot of preservatives and other things. So diet's a number one thing, as, as always. Now, with your stress responses, uh, if you're having you know emotional stresses, obviously, guys, if you can if you can remove yourself from if you can identify a known stressor, then you try to you've got to try to um, resolve that or separate yourself from it. So <clears throat> you know it's easier said than done, right? I, I understand that. So if you have like a stressful job you need to figure out how to make that job less stressful or find another job, right? Um, there's, there are a lot of things, anything that, it's just, it's pretty obvious, right? Like, you know, if you know something is stressing you out, then you need to try to figure out a technique or a way to modify that. Now, you can also focus on trying to train your body to have a different response to the stressor, right? That's also, that's not unreasonable. So things like meditation are going to be really important. Prayer, anything where you can, you know, where you're, um, you're, you're focusing on um, like quieting your mind. Breathing techniques and a lot of things like that are also very, very helpful. So there was a, there was a study done. Uh, someone shared with me that, uh, that I met, and I, some of you guys might know this. I've, I've mentioned it before. Um, <clears throat> was, um, was that basically there was a study done by Herbert Benson, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, and what he did was he looked at people that were lifelong meditators, right? And they looked at their genetics and they compared those people to people in the general population. And they found that there were about 2,500 genes of the 25,000 that were different than people that didn't meditate. And a lot of these genes had to do with the expression of your stress response. And guys, think of this. Your genetics are kind of like a cookbook for the manufacturing. It's like the recipes for the manufacturing of proteins that your body makes to help rebuild, repair, and carry out your physiological processes. So these people that were meditating had had um, a different, were showing different expression of about 2,500 genes, a lot of them related to stress. So what, he, what um, um, uh, Mr. Dr. Benson did was he took, um, he took people that were, did, did not meditate and or and did not do this type of practice looked at their genes and then put them through an eight week long course at the end of eight weeks he found that 500 of those 2500 genes that the lifelong meditators had that were different were changed in people that were going through a meditation practice guys that's huge and a lot of those genes were related to the stress response right so a lot of things we're talking about is really really important guys the more and more that i learn about this stuff the more that i realize that the mind body connection is major is, is a major factor 
um, for recovery. And it's, it's also something that is being missed in, 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 a, in a big way. And um, <clears throat> as more research comes out about it, and I think as we can more quantitatively um, observe these things, you're going to hear more and more about it. But it's, um, it's something that's really, really important. So meditation, prayer, all these things are, um, are really, really important so that you can, uh, you can have uh, better, um, better genetic expression and stress response. So, uh, of course, try to remove the stressors and then um, obviously try to pick up a practice like meditation, um, prayer, whatever's, whatever's best for you, right? Go outside and just be in nature. Walk in the woods. Um, go for a walk. Those are all things that help to quiet the mind and can kind of let you think and be in your own, in your own head. So that's, and that's a, that's a, a you know, a good thing. Um, really, really important because cortisol is, is elevated with, with uh, the stress responses and cortisol has, has several impacts when it's elevated for a prolonged period of time or repetitively it's, it's being spiked up. It has um, several negative uh, consequences to our thyroid physiology, to our blood sugar physiology, to the repair of our mucosal um, and our barrier systems. Uh, it also, cortisol, when it's being produced repetitively, it's also going to impact our sex hormone production, so estrogens and testosterones. You can actually uh, create a scenario where your body steals away an intermediate hormone that's needed to make your testosterone and estrogen, called pregnenolone, to make cortisol. You're driving the production of cortisol, driving it, driving it through the stress or through uh, a lot of different mechanisms can do it. <clears throat> and, and it will rob away the pregnenolone and you won't be able to produce your estrogen and testosterone. And if you don't understand that physiology or if your doctor doesn't understand that, that potential uh, pregnenolone steal, that problem that can occur where you're robbing this hormone away and they look just look at your estrogen and testosterone, or the symptoms of, of uh, potential testosterone deficiencies or estrogen deficiencies, then they may not, you know, they might be treating a symptom rather than a cause because the stressors, the um, blood sugar is huge with that. So these are all things that are really, really important. If you want, you know, to have optimal thyroid physiology, it's one of the things you're going to have to look at. <laughs> I see that. I see that, Dawn. <laughs> Dawn's comment, uh, box of wine. <laughs> She's just kidding. She said, I'm just kidding. <clears throat> Just started doing yoga. Susie, awesome. Great. Susie um, said she's a chanting, a chanting uh, Buddhist for over 30 years. You know, there's so much power in um, the spoken um, mantras and um, those, I mean, there's been studies done. Uh, my my mother-in-law would know so much about this. Um, she thinks she told me, but that's that, um, those, those deeper, those deeper um, chants and tones that are used in certain types of meditation have been shown to um, release nitric oxide in the body. And you guys have to, you know, we'd have to talk about that another day because I definitely don't have time to go into all that. But it's extremely interesting what happens. Um, <clears throat> uh, let's see. And Susie said she's doing yoga. Linda, Las Vegas. Hey, what's up, guys? Hey, if you're new or if you haven't been on here, tell me where you're from. I'd like to see where you guys are today. I'm starting on my license surgery in 70. Can't find a good doctor who gets it. Um, Linda, hang in there. Look. Everything that, that I try to teach is uh, to try and help you help yourself. And um, there's, there's a lot of stuff like that. I'll just try to give you everything I can to help give you some guidance. But um, hang in there. There's, there's a lot of, there, there are great, great, brilliant people in this world. I've met so many and had an opportunity to learn from them. Um, they're, um, they're there. Um, so I'll help you as much as I can. Um, Julia. What test will tell you? Okay, sorry, I'm kind of reading from the last up. So let's go up here and take a quick look. Jessica, Rachel, hi Rachel. Hope you're doing. Hope you're doing well. Thank you for all the wonderful pictures you've been posting. By the way, really appreciate seeing what you've been eating. Um, absolutely, it was um, amazing to see you do that. Hey Kimberly. Hey Randy. Hey, I appreciate it, man. Um, we got to get that program out to you today. So thank you for uh, the comments and stuff the other day. Um, I think you emailed us through our, through our website, so I'll make sure my staff knows. Every weekend when we come back on Mondays, we are just overwhelmed with so, so many messages. It's unbelievable. Uh, it just goes to show you like how uh, much of a need that there is for this type of information. So we're trying to get through everything. Um, it, um, but it's good to see you, Randy. Hi, from the, from the Netherlands. Hi. Awesome. Donna. 
I'm always um, around stress because of my family. You know what, man? It's it's so hard. Like when you talk about stress, to help people figure out how to control these things. Um, so one of the things I do is I do like a five minute journal. Um, Donna, like every morning, I wake up and I say, okay, three things that that um, I'm grateful for today. And then I go through. There's a, there's a the five minute journal gives you this in each page. There's a morning and a night, basically section to it. So in the morning, you start out by waking up and you write the three things that you're grateful for. So I'm grateful for the opportunity of today. That's that's my first thing always because I'm just glad to be alive to have this opportunity. Second thing, like today was, I was uh. I did it kind of after I took a shower and I was like, you know what? I am grateful. I'm so glad that I have warm water, that I have a shower. And I just went on and on. Like you don't have to just write three things, but <clears throat> you know, and it doesn't have to be something that's like, you know, you can be grateful for whatever it is, you know, socks on your feet, um, grateful for water that's clean, you know, grateful for clean air. I mean, there's, there, it just, it can be anything, but just coming from this place of gratitude every day. And then I write down, um, <clears throat> I am statement and it's I am you know um, <clears throat> I put I am I am um, the world's best husband father um, you know a teacher uh, I am and I and I just write those statements and I keep on going and going and going <clears throat> until until I'm basically out you know and I keep going so that's a great place to start because that gives you some perspective and that helps frame your day I'm telling you it makes a difference it might sound kind of hokey but it really really works for me and at the end of the day I write three things great things three amazing things that happened today and how could I have made today better like like one or two things like what could I have done to make today better that helps me a lot and then uh, you know prayer meditation or anything like that's really really powerful but trying to breathing exercises and techniques like it, it takes work sometimes like really it takes work and some people you know they're in your life they're under so much stress that they, uh, it gets it gets pretty deep. But like I mean, almost there's this codependence, and they 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 need someone to um, to help them for sure. But but their um, their stress and their way of handling their stress is to almost involve you in it or transfer it to you. And you've got to I don't that's a lot more complicated. Uh, but you know, definitely, when there's really difficult, when there's difficult uh, emotional and relationship uh, dynamics, then it's almost it's important if it's possible for you to, you know, consider counseling with that person or for that person and trying to help to improve the relationship. And that's tough to do because that that takes a lot of work. No one really is like, yeah, I can't wait to go to counseling. You know, it's 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 a serious thing. So Donna, I hope that helps you out. Hey Janice, yes, yeah, so stressed. Yes, please do hang in there. Hang in there, guys. Hi, Dawn. Awesome. Awesome, Mickey. Hopefully, um, great. If you haven't heard from my staff yet, so Mickey got thyroid antibodies test done, or she requested it through our office, we can get thyroid antibodies uh, TPO and thyroid peroxidase for $20, and so she did that. So awesome. Awesome. I can't wait. Hopefully, um, we're able to help you figure some things out. Stress is so hard to avoid. I know guys, it is, it's tough. Hi Rita in, in Idaho. Hi Jen. Uh, any suggestions to get my doctor to send me to an endocrinologist? Um, you have fibromyalgia, myofascial pain syndrome, and they won't look any further. Jen, you know, when I first, when I first started into practice, like, um, I, <clears throat> I started working with, and I started reading, because it was fascinating to me, um, about fibromyalgia. And, <clears throat> that diagnosis, really, what I, the conclusion that I eventually came to, was that it's. I, I don't think it was. A, I didn't think it was a good diagnosis for anyone to have because you know what. I, what I the first thing was when I realized that fibromyalgia was just really broken down and it just meant muscle pain is all it meant. But it was just a way of saying it that sounded like a diagnosis that really indicated something when really the diagnosis could just simply be muscle musculoskeletal pain. And and I realized that the, it, that wasn't helpful. It was just a it was just a way to pacify people, to make them feel like they had something, they had they mm -hmm. finally had something. And I was like, man, it's so misleading. That diagnosis is so misleading. And what I found out with most people that had fibromyalgia, that the large majority of them had some kind of 
physiological breakdown in their thyroid uh, in, in their, their thyroid chemistry. So they might have had normal TSH and normal thyroid hormone levels, but they couldn't tra they couldn't transport their hormones well, or they had high levels of inflammation that was decreasing sensitivity, or they had gut problems. And, and usually, it's a combination of several things. It's not it's not just one thing. So. Um, you know, if they send you to an endocrinologist, I'm not saying that won't be beneficial. It very well could be, but a lot of times, you know, the endocrinologists are going to just do the same workup that your primary did, um, or they're going to, they might do a further workup, and, and it's more likely that you'll get a further workup there. Uh, but a lot of times, it's it's very similar. I mean, I've, I've seen people that have been, you know, quote-unquote, everywhere, and they've literally been to a lot of most prestigious research hospitals all over the world. Um, and you talk to them and you're just like, wow, this is the same workup that I see done quite a bit. Um, and, and it's not that any of those places aren't good. There's a lot of them that find a lot of things that I wouldn't. But the fact is, is it's just that, you know, it's that, it's that thought process. It's not really as much um, focused on root cause resolution. I mean, and, and, it's, and it's not that they don't want that for you. It's just that that's not that model. It's not the traditional medical model. So, I don't know. I mean, there's not really much of a way. Your doctor's not going to refer you to an, end an endocrinologist if their testing does not indicate, in indicate an, an, endocrine pro an, an endocrine problem that warrants a referral. Okay, so here's the thing. If your doctor sends you to an endocrinologist and you go to the endocrinologist and the endocrinologist looks at the note from the doctor and is like, why are you here? They'll feel like their time is wasted. I mean, and, they, and sometimes though, I've, I've just seen it happen. Um, I've seen it happen. So there has to be a reason to refer you or the endocrinologist is going to be really upset because they're, they're like, so you've got to have some kind of rationale behind it. And I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just telling you like that's what I, I know what's um, how it works and, and that's how it is unfortunately. So I hope that helps, Jim. I'm sorry if um, it's not helping, um, but I, I tried. Hi, Donna. Don't worry. Work at it little by little. Work at it. Just work at it. Start with diet. Start with things to change your internal chemistry. That will that can impact and change your response to the stressors. So if you're inflamed and your body's your, your body chemistry is not, not optimal and you change your diet and now you're not and so inflamed, once you start having your stress response mm -hmm. could be improved just by changing your internal chemistry through diet. So it's always a great, great place to start. Then you start layering on meditation or prayer or um, deep, deep breathing exercises or biofeedback or um, neurofeedback or all these things to really help improve your mental state. Man, you're, you're talking about some you know, very profound possibilities and changes. And a lot of those things you can completely do on your own and do them free. You can even, you know, if you want to layer in even some supplementation, nutritional supplementation, you can definitely do that too that can help with the stress response. So, but there's not really, like, guys, it's going to be really tough for me. Like, you, you won't see me typically just recommending generic supplementation. I try to be very specific because enough people come to me with a ton of supplements that doesn't help them. So I don't want you guys just to go out and buy a bunch of supplements that are not going to be helpful. You really want to um, assess your where you are or work with someone that can help assess where you are and, and help give you guidance on what might be best to support your body's chemistry and what's breaking down or what might need need some help. Like um, <clears throat> So for example, if I have someone that's really stressed, I might have them um, use ashwagandha, which is a root and an adrenal gland adaptogen. That might be one thing that I would have them incorporate, but I don't want them to take it forever. But that, that might help them with the uh, too much cortisol or too little cortisol. Uh, so that's, that's one thing that's... Uh, a possibility. Magnesium is always also very helpful. It kind of calms you, and most people are deficient in magnesium, so that's a good thing to consider. Hey, Janice in Central Florida. Hi, Susie. Chewing really well. Not sure where that came from, but with stress, you know what, Susie? Maybe you just, I've seen your comments. You, you know some stuff, don't you? you? Chewing is interesting because when you chew, guys, think about this. When you chew, Chewing is not just a mechanical way to break up your food, okay? It's not. It, it does serve a purpose. But this chewing and this movement activates nerves that come from the brain stem to the face, okay? Now think about this for a second. When you chew, you're actually sending signals from nerves to the face to the brain stem, letting the brain stem know that you're chewing. And guess what your brain stem does? Your brain stem primes starts to fire to the vagus nerve, okay, or the vagal nuclei. So 
the vagus nerve goes from the brainstem to your and, and innervates the nerves go into your entire digestive tract. So when you chew, you're actually priming your digestive system. And guess what? If we break the the um, nervous system into two branches, it's going to be the sympathetic nervous system, which is your fight or flight system, and the parasympathetic, which is the rest and digest system. Now, parasympathetic is typically calming down. You're not going to digest well if you're in fight or flight mode all the time. That's why a lot of people, you know, today's modern society stress is through the roof, so people are stuck in the sympathetic dominant state, and their body, they cannot get their body and their, and their parasympathetic nervous system working optimally, so they have poor digestion because they have poor activation of the vagus nerve, so they have poor stomach acid production, poor pancreatic enzyme production, poor biliary uh, release of bile salts. They have, um, they have poor uh, gut motility and peristalsis, which is this movement of how the, the gut moves uh, food through the intestinal tract. It's, it's profound. So chewing 10 to 30 times per bite is really important. Uh, so I just want to share that. That's a great one, Susie. I think that's what you were getting at. Is it detrimental? Um, um, Gemma says, does keeping fit really help us with autoimmune conditions for stress, etc., or is it detrimental? So Gemma, here's the, the, short, um, the short answer is exercise can be good, it can be bad. There's, there's, it can actually have two different effects. If you're, um, if you're stimulating a stress response, it's too much. Okay. Now, here's the thing. Now, there's a, there's you stress, which is good stress, and then there's stress, which would be bad stress, right? There's like, so there's good stressors, and so that's what you want to do. Is here's the general rule of thumb. If you feel exhausted and wiped out after you've exercised, you've overtrained. If you feel like after you exercise, if you even this could be, and it's going to be a different threshold for every person. If you go walking, or if <clears throat> you know you could do very minimal, something very minimal, your brain should feel turned on, and you should feel like you have blood flowing well. You should feel alert and awake. If you feel wiped out after you've exercised, you've overtrained. Okay, I'm just going to tell you, unless you're a very high level elite athlete, and then you have to know your recovery, how long it takes you to properly recover, because it can also be a cumulative effect. You do a little too much, and you do a little too much all the time, and it can, it can cause problems with, with overtraining, which actually produces, bumps up cortisol, and there's a lot of different ways to try and evaluate that. You can look at um, resting heart rate and some other things to help you determine if it's higher, like you wake up and your resting heart rate's higher, then, then it could be that you're, you've overtrained, okay, because you're in a, in a more sympathetic Sympathetically dominant state. I hope that helps. It's kind of deep, but um, it's a it's a pretty good thing. Okay, I see Julia says she's been on the diet for a month. How will I know if I'm getting better if the antibodies don't correlate with the severity of the autoimmune condition? So Julia, you, you should number one, systemic your function should be improving. So you know, did you have like digestive problems? Did you have um, problems sleeping? Um, did you have energy problems? You know, do, did you have, you know, is, is there anything that's improving symptomatically? And that's really going to be your best gauge when you, if you don't have like a quantitative test. And, and the antibodies are not, they don't correlate with the severity of your autoimmunity, guys. If they're coming down, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're, that you're healthier. I mean, you could have immunosuppression and they would come down. And there's, I go into that in some other videos. So it's kind of tough, Julia, to, to be able to give you a very specific way to guide. Like, so, um, you know, anyone that goes through our Hashimoto's transformation program, we do an assessment first, then they go through the diet, then they're going to do a reassessment at the end. You want to compare the assessments and the scores and see where you're at, okay? So if you guys don't know about that, you can go to, like, thyroidprogram.com and you can learn about our Hashimoto's transformation program. You can actually enter to win it which we're giving away in, what's today? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we'll be giving it away because we give one co we give two copies of the program away to one person so they can give it away to someone or, or, or to a friend and they can go through it. We do that every month. Try to help you guys out. Um, what test will tell me if it's helping? There's not really a way to know um, if it's helping, I mean, unless you have a baseline to begin with, right? So symptomatically is about what you're, you're, you're looking at. Digestive function, you know, do you feel better? And if you don't feel better, guys, when you're going through some dietary changes, then I'm going to tell you that what you should probably do is, is if diet is not helping you to feel significantly better, then the next step is going to be you got, you've got to figure out what's driving the process. Like, why do you feel the way you feel? And you probably need to get some help and work with someone to help you identify potential drivers of your autoimmunity, 
um, if the diet's not making a profound impact, okay? Las Vegas, hey. How you doing, Linda? Can't move, can't find a good doctor who gets it. Yeah, I'm sorry. Chanting, okay, so I'm back up some of the comments. <laughs> wine, wine does help you. Guys, wine is kind of a double-edged sword, seriously. Um, like, alcohol in general is typically not good at all for autoimmunity. Um, wine, that you hear people talk about the benefits, they're really talking about resveratrol in the wine. And, um, you know, if you don't drink wine, don't start drinking it for your, your stress response. Um, I, I'm not an advocate of, of doing that, though. Um, it's just the alcohol and stuff. Until your, your body's healthier, uh, if you're, especially if you're struggling, until your body's healthier, I would not consider introducing really any alcohol. Um, and I'm not going to say that, you know, if you guys watch my, one of my videos of the past like two weekends ago when I was in Atlanta, you know that I didn't follow my own advice there. <laughs> uh, let's see. Lindsay. Hey, Rapid City, South Dakota. My wife was born in South Dakota somewhere. Not exactly sure of the state. I can't remember the city, but she was born in South Dakota. Um, she has, still has family there, actually. Uh, let's see. Michigan, California, the UK. Oh, Susie, so you're in the UK. Very cool. Um, Clayton. Hey, Linda, I think we've been on here before. Unless there's, I'm sure there's probably other people from Clayton that have been on here. North Carolina. Hi, Donna. Linda, stay in there. Hang in there. You can do it. Rhode Island. Hi. That, I think that's Marinella. I hope I'm not like butchering your name. You're from Europe and Croatia. Oh, very interesting. Um... Marinella, they, there should be a radiologist, if you have a thyroid ultrasound done, a radiologist really needs to read it. I don't, I don't read um, and do radiology reports on thyroid ultrasounds, or, or I would try to help you. But you typically what you have to have is you want to have an ultrasound done, and then the radiologist will read the ultrasound afterwards. And then I typically get the report and I look at it to understand the, the characteristics. So I'm sorry, I can't, I can't um, do that. That's really, you need a radiologist that's trained in reading those every single day, and that's all they do to read those. I'm glad it's, I'm glad it's helpful, uh, Leona. Yeah, it all, it all fits together, guys. It's all connected. Illinois. <laughs> yes, multitasking is so true, Andy. Andy's on here. Everyone say hi to Andy. <laughs> Andy is uh, Andy is one of the metabolic coordinators, um, master of everything in my office, and tries to help things keep things going and respond to you guys. And uh, we try to juggle a lot of different balls and stay organized. But uh, she and Alicia make everything work. So please do thank them, or none of this would be possible. Um, is there medication to reduce cortisol levels? Um, <clears throat> I'm not really sure about prescriptive meds for, for to reduce cortisol, uh, but you know, like like I was mentioned earlier, ashwagandha is something ashwagandha root, something that we that we commonly uh, recommend to people that have issues with cortisol problems. If the production, the rate and rhythm of cortisol is is off, so you have a normal circadian or daily rhythm of cortisol production should be higher in the morning, lower in the evening, and start coming up throughout the night and evening. If you're not following that rhythm of production, then sometimes we, we will use something called phosphatidylserine as, a, as something. And all those, the supplements that we use and recommend are in, um, they're in um, my private uh, nutraceutical dispensary that any of you guys can create an account to it if you want. And you just, you just go to, um, we can share, I think it's HashimotosSupplements.com. If you go to HashimotosSupplements.com, It'll actually take you to a page, you enter your email address, and I'll actually walk you through a process of assessing yourself, like we mentioned earlier. And then uh, I do a little workshop where I help you understand your assessment, and then you can get access to our supplementation um, private dispensary that I use for everyone that I work with around the country and world. Uh, and you can see the supplements that I use. I have them kind of associated with each category of the assessment form. So I hope that helps. I hope that helps, um, Denise. Hi, Janice. Started walking, music, deep breathing, nature is awesome. Nature is naturally calming, guys. I'm telling you, getting out in nature, being in the, around the trees, it sounds crazy, but it's not. Um, you know, if you get a chance, seriously, go outside. Yeah, any of you guys ever walk on the beach and feel how calming it is? And you're like, oh man, I just love being at the beach. I feel so de-stressed. When you get, when you, when you go to the beach, you should take your shoes off and walk on the sand, right? With the water. 
Well, you guys know that there's this concept called grounding. You've probably heard of it, or earthing, right? Where the contact of your bare feet to the ground helps with a transfer of electrons. It's like a natural antioxidant. Guys, it's, it's a legitimate thing. It's not, um, there, there needs to be more research, but it's a legitimate thing. We're the only species that walks around with shoes, guys. Think about it. The only ones. And you don't, you know, we, we're so used to some of the things that we consider just everyday, um, you know, that's, that's, uh, we, we take for granted or sometimes we just, we just, because something's common, we think it, it's, it's normal, but you got to kind of look at things and kind of step back and say, wait a second, is it right for me to always walk around with rubber insulated shoes and never contact the earth? I mean, you just, you know, anyway, I know, laugh out loud, I see, right? It's, it's not normal. Cincinnati, how you doing? Hashis. Hey, Christy. Hey, Jessica. Uh, cortisol or low adrenal function are really... Guys, here's the a, here's a deal. So your adrenal glands on top of the kidneys produce cortisol. Cortisol dis, or, or adrenal dysfunction, high or low, is always secondary to something else. Something is driving it, okay? So it's either autoimmunity or inflammation or chronic stress or, in, or, or an infection that's producing inflammation. Um, so these are, it's always secondary. It's not, the adrenals are not, it's not the primary problem. I'm just going to tell you, there's always something that's, that's pushing the adrenals. Okay, so Jessica asked, you know, how do you properly address low cortisol or low adrenal function? Well, first of all, you've got to identify, like, what is, what are, what's the adrenal dysfunction secondary to? Like, what is that main thing? And then you're going to make sure that, you want to make sure that there's good um, vitamin and minerals, uh, there are good vitamins and, vitamin and minerals available to produce the adrenal hormones. The second thing that you want to do is you might use things like ashwagandha and phosphatidylserine to help improve the stress response and improve the circadian rhythm and production. Um, hey, Leona. Awesome. Um, I, I'm telling you what, I'm happy to be alive too. Leona says, I'm happy to be alive. I'm blessed. You know, guys, um, it's it's something to wake up with a, with a perspective of gratitude every day. It has changed. It's changed me a lot. And uh, I think it, it's taken me it's taken me a lot of time. And, uh, and experience and to see loss and to have children to, to get to this place. And um, <clears throat> it's just, it's something that, um, you, you, you know, youth um, is, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's anyway, I was, I've learned a lot as I've, as I've grown up, let's say. So hi in Illinois, Samantha. Hi, Jennifer. It does work awesome. Um, hopefully something I've mentioned. Um, yeah, there can be, Dawn, there's, um, Dawn just said, you know, she had to eliminate people from her life that caused a lot of stress and drama. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, sometimes those relationships are very toxic and poisonous, and uh, it, it's just, it's unfortunate, but um, sometimes you can't save everyone, guys. You can't, you can't save people. And, <clears throat> you know, actually, it's kind of uh, ironic because that's what I try to do. I try to, like, save people and help 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 them help themselves. But one thing that you understand and that you start to realize really quickly when you try to help people is that all you can do is try your best to help people. That's people in your life. And that's people that like I work with too. I just do my best to help them, but you can't save everyone. Um, you, you can try your best, but it's just complicated, right? I mean, it's just like your relationships and, and, and things that you guys that drive stress in your life. It's easier said than done, and um, you can want something so badly for someone, but they have to want to change for themselves. They have to be problem aware. There's just a lot of issues there. Hi, Julia. Samantha, hi. How are you? Stress is huge. Yeah, positive list is great. Donna, Leona. Yes, we've got, to pay, we've got to pay attention to ourselves and our needs and listen to our body. Hi, Jen. Thanks. Jen says, thank you. Uh, that's what I believe that's, it's being, that's being missed. Hi, Rachel. Um, Rachel, that's a tough one. Um, you know, with what you're going through uh, with the goiter, uh, those, those issues with nodules, if they've... Um, I don't know if they've been biopsied, but, you know, sometimes it's just a hard decision to make. I mean, goiters, when the thyroid gets larger, can create lots of problems, lots of potential issues for, um, for swallowing, breathing. You know, it, it has its own risks. And then, um, you know, definitely you need to know if you're auto... Did you say... 
your graves. I'm not sure you didn't. I don't think I saw that. Um, but if you're autoimmune, listen, guys. If you have your thyroid removed, if you if, so, if you have Graves' disease, which is the hyperthyroidism, which is most of the people that have had their thyroid. You know, you're going to hear more people say, yeah, "I've had my thyroid removed or ablated." Is typically due to hyperthyroidism. If you if that's occurred, then you still have to. The people say, "Well, am I still autoimmune?" Yes. You still have the autoimmune process that's 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 occurring, but the target of the autoimmunity is is primarily removed. So you won't necessarily have antibodies anymore, but you're definitely you still have the autoimmune process. And if you're reacting to foods, or if there's a chronic infection, or if there are environmental chemicals, those will still drive an immune response, and you can have expanded autoimmunity to other tissues. So that's really really important. Uh, costochondritis. Um, Angela says, "What do you think of costochondritis?" Uh, my mother had that for a long time, and we found that um, enzymes, taking like um, papaya enzymes, what else were it? What was it? Um, bromelain. Several things were helpful, <coughs> but addressing, you know, really coming back to systemic body chemistry is what was is where I would really start. Like I would consider autoimmune paleo, making sure that you don't have nutrient deficiencies, uh, making sure that you have good essential fatty acid levels, adequate vitamin D. Um, if there's any other problems, improve your gut health. Do everything that you can to be as healthy as possible, and usually the inflammation comes down. I know it's not always that simple with costochondritis, but I hope that helps. Hi, Rita. T three types of arthritis with graves. Those, those, those sound like those could be um, autoimmune arthritis. Uh, type forms of auto autoimmune arthritis, so definitely that would be something that I would consider and recommend that you really look into, you know, autoimmune, paleo, identifying the drivers of the autoimmunity, so food proteins, chronic infections, and environmental chemicals, okay? Those are the things that I would really, really look into. All right, guys, it is time for me to go. I got to get back to the office, but um, I'll be working out. I guess, hey guys, I'm going to be coming, <laughs> I know Andy and Alicia are probably on here, I'm going to be um, I'm going to be coming to the office for my for my appointment, and then I'm just going to come back home and work out. Um, can I share share tips for starting the AIP diet? I want to make some changes in February. Do I go all in or ease into it, guys? I prefer and I find that people are much better when they go all in to the autoimmune paleo diet versus easing into it. And the reason for that is because you know a lot of times if people go all in they can see like some really profound, significant results within four or five days. They might not feel too great if they're detoxing from certain foods and caffeine, like initially, but yeah, they can feel really good after, after you know, four or five days. Whereas if they go a little bit in at a time, your, your, your determination and your, your um, ability to uh, stay focused on what you're doing can, can really um, diminish and then you lose motivation because you might not be feeling better either because you're going really slow. Definitely, I'm a fan of going all in. Um, I've seen and, and, and heard for doctors and, and people will take out one food at a time, one food at a time. It'll take you forever. So first of all, you have to stay organized forever and then it's just you might not get benefit. So I'm all I'm for going all in with it um, and seeing how you, know, how you do. Hi, Janice. Susie, did I say drink your eat? <laughs> uh, yoga, would yoga be a great way to deal with stress? Uh, uh. Your Hashi. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you know what, Andy, Andy, who's uh, in my office, um, she is a yogi, and she is uh, she's awesome, and she's gonna actually do some videos and a few things to actually help some people. We've talked about it. So now it's a good time to uh, to mention it. She's gonna do some. Um, we're gonna we're gonna we talked about doing maybe like a live class, a yoga class, and you guys can see. And I'm gonna be in the class too, so uh, you get to see my lack of flexibility. But yeah, yoga is a great way to deal with stress. I think it's a fantastic way to help your body and then deal with stress. You just have to do it at your own pace and in a way that's uh, that's safe for you because everyone's gonna have different levels, right? Uh, organic apple cider vinegar is a real possibility to help increase um, stomach acidity. Um, yeah, listen to your body, definitely. Um, Janice says, hear it. Yeah, I agree. Um, okay. Hashimoto's transformation program, yes. Thank you, for Cindy, for saying that I'm awesome. 
Uh, AIP. Antibodies doing good. Angela. Man, I can't really answer that right now because I got to get going. But, um, yeah, Susie. Yeah, I, you know what? Giving up alcohol made me. Well, I say giving up alcohol. Uh, like once every year or two, I think I'm smarter. Uh, I think I'm I'm good, and I try alcohol again, and then it, it, it teaches me a lesson. But uh, Susie said, I'm so much better since giving up alcohol. Yeah, me too. Hey, Mindy in Kentucky. Linda, yoga. Yeah. Yep, I think yoga's great. Andy in my office is fantastic. She's literally legit yogi. Um, so it's very, very good. She's amazing. Um, you really like her. Uh, she's She and Alicia are both just fantastic people. Um, New York, Dunn, North Carolina. Hey Michelle, hope you're doing well. Thank you for the thank you for those kind words. Hey Janice. Hey Linda again. Some of you guys I'm saying hey to. Thank you, Andy. Okay, so cortisol is high. It's truly awful. Yeah, guys, sometimes you can have really high cortisol or really low cortisol, and that could actually be an autoimmune condition called either Cushing's with high cortisol or Addison's with low cortisol. So you gotta be careful with those, alright? Hi, Melanie. Gosh, I wish I could answer that. I just don't have time. There's there's more there. Uh, let's see. Okay. Diet therapy. Yeah, it's so true, Jennifer. There's, there's Food is medicine for sure. Laughter. Ooh, Jessica, I love that. Jessica Atwood says, hey, laughter helps me. Laughter is profound, guys. It is so huge. It helps with uh, your T-cell regulatory function, so immune function, like literally. Um, grounding every day. I hear you, Angela. Awesome. Dirt therapy in Kansas. Get out there and get in the dirt. No kidding. It's not a joke. Get out there and get those the dirt and the microbes and all the stuff that we were have been exposed to, um, you know, before we had this modernized lifestyle. And uh, try to get your gut and your microbiome back in health. Yeah, man. I, Cheryl says, hey, I live out in the country and the peacefulness of it makes a big difference. I'm envious of that. Um, I need to do that too. Have a walk every day. Dogs, yes, yes. Animals are amazing. Um, just started yoga. Awesome. Um, can I ask to get tests for my adrenals? Anna. Yeah, you can get, you can get a blood test that'll just draw your first morning cortisol. And that's, it, it's better than nothing. Um, but if it, if it's not within the reference range, if it's above or below, as long as it's not like really, really low or really, really high, then it's, it's a, it's a functional shift. And that's more indicative of uh, needing phosphatidylserine potentially. But I like the, uh, dried urine. I like the Dutch test. Dried urine, total comprehensive hormones. Some people do salivary. Hi from Iowa. Cortisol blood test, they say it's normal. Uh, but the shot they gave me made me feel great. Yeah, listen, if someone's giving you Cortef or some kind of uh, of cortisol, then yeah, you you feel great because it'll energize you. It, it does a lot of things, but I'm going to tell you right now, guys. Cortisol, um, there's a research paper several years ago, and it stated um, that there was no safe dose of cortisol. So as a, as, a, as a prescription, there was no safe dose that it posed a lot of risk to women for bone demineralization and lots of other problems. Um, but sometimes if you're on that stuff for a long period of time, you, you, you can't come off of it because you suppress the, the feedback loop to the brain and, and then the brain never signals the adrenals to make it again. So you have to stay on it. Uh, people really have to help themselves. You can only be a guide. Absolutely. <laughs> Linda, thank you. Yes. Yeah, I was uh, 15. She said, I uh, had fabulous teeth. Shout out to my orthodontist. So true. Dr. Hamilton in Hickory did me right when I was 13. Um, they're still still holding up, so I'm in great shape. Thank you for that compliment. Hi. Hi. I know, Randy. Right? It's like I get on here and it's like, ah, I'm, I'm, I'm compelled. Um, thyroid removed due to cancer all over it. Yeah, you're doing good, Cheryl. You're doing a lot of good stuff for yourself, seriously. Um, Removed due to cancer, REI, still have uh, radiation um, ablation, still have antibodies. It's possible, guys. The, the radiation iodine therapy doesn't always get all the, the thyroid tissue. Howdy from Texas. How you doing, Melinda? Um, Jessica, vitamin uh, what vitamin deficiencies do you check for? Um, I do that. Usually that's not one of the first things I'll start with at all because I'll just give a multivitamin that fills in most of the nutrient potholes, focus on diet, nutrient-dense foods, and then um, work on the top priorities first. Um, so I don't usually test for that unless that's one of the unless some that's one of my lower priority tests actually because a lot of times we can address the primary deficiencies with a good multivitamin okay and and nutrient dense foods just there's there's other ways to prioritize the spending of your money I just so I hope that helps Jessica uh, Tina what do you think about TPO of uh, five thousand five hundred definitely Hashimoto's but what does that mean it's just 
it's just off the charts. I mean, it just means it's really high. Now, if you have thyroglobulin antibodies that are that high, you know, you always want to have, when you have really high antibodies, I'm a big advocate of getting an ultrasound done, and you need someone to touch and palpate your thyroid to see if there's nodules. If there's nodules, you need to get your thyroid checked. Um, so hopefully, definitely get an ultrasound, have someone touch your thyroid with antibodies that high, but listen, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's it's worse, okay? I want you to know that. Um, the there are people that, that still have Hashimoto's and have no antibodies and it can be immune suppression, they can just be seronegative, there's a lot of factors. Okay guys, well um, I'm out of here too, hope you guys have a wonderful one, thank you for all the wonderful feedback, please give us some hearts, give us give a bunch of hearts, a bunch of, a bunch of thumbs up and guys, share our messages with other people because think about this, when you first learned this stuff or if you're just now learning it, think about how many millions of people have thyroid problems, 70 million people have gut problems, 30 million people in the U.S. alone have thyroid problems. So please do share this information with other people so they can hear it, so that they can learn how to help themselves and take their health back because there's a lot of folks that are struggling. And uh, just think about if you would have heard some of this stuff 10 years ago or five years ago, what kind of difference might it have made. So appreciate you guys so much. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. And uh, I'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Hey guys, Dr. Shook, thank you for viewing our videos. I hope they help you out. If you want to, just subscribe to our channel somewhere here. You can watch a video um, that YouTube's actually selected for you, so hopefully it'll help you out. If you need any other information or resources, just look in the description. We've got links to our website, to our nine lab test guidebook, and everything else that we do. I really appreciate you, and I hope you guys have a great day.